910 Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome to the bonus episode of No Trash, Just Truth. In yesterday's episode, we started looking at the letters John writes to the seven churches in Asia in Revelation chapters 1 to 3. We made it through the three of the churches in the last episode. That's right. So we'll finish up the last four today. And moving on to the church in Thyatira, Chris, let's read Revelation 2, 18 to 29. It says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only Hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my work until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this church is commended for their love, faith, service, and their patient endurance, and their later works are greater or more abundant than earlier. So, Rose, I see at least for some of them, there's some Christian growth and some real fruit here in this church. It certainly seems to be the case. However, the church was tolerating a self-proclaimed prophet who's referred to as Jezebel, who's teaching and seducing people in the church into, as the words say, sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. Chris, Jezebel is a reference back to the Old Testament. She was King Ahab's wife, and she imposed Baal worship on the nation of Israel. In the beginning of this letter, Jesus describes himself with eyes like flames of fire and feet like burnished bronze. These are images that bring to mind metalworking. The city of Thyatira was known for its trade guilds, which you had to be a member of if you wanted to use your skills to earn a living. Kind of like our unions now, in some cases. Yes, exactly. These guilds held feasts honoring pagan gods that included sexual immorality, including orgies. Hopefully not like our unions now. (laughs) Hopefully not like that. (laughs) At least I haven't heard of that. But, Rose, the likely scenario here is that this woman, Jezebel, is telling people it was okay to join the guilds. This would have been tempting because they couldn't earn a living in their craft without joining in. These people are compromising what the Bible says for their own comfort, and in this case, maybe even to stay alive. So their choice would be sin against God and feed my children, or me and my family go hungry. Rose, people use the excuse, God wouldn't want your family to go hungry. God knows your heart. God will understand he wouldn't want you to suffer all the time. You and I talked about that in our God and my government benefits episode. We did. And there are many people who compromise just for the sake of their own comfort. You know, there's a lot of individuals who call themselves Christians and even whole churches that compromise what the Bible says and teach others to do the same just for the sake of being able to live their lives however they want. The question they need to ask themselves and we need to ask ourselves is, will Jesus understand and overlook this? And for this Thyatira church, will he do it if it's for the sake of being able to earn a living to feed your family? You know, as another thing we talked about in an episode, 
following Jesus is very costly sometimes. Yeah. Luke 9, 23 to 26, Jesus is talking here and he says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. That's echoed in both Matthew and Mark's Gospels too. That's right. We can't follow our hearts and our feelings, as we've talked about in another episode, because they're both deceitful. Right. This means that we can't have sex outside the biblical context. We can't ignore the poor and needy. We can't lie and cheat, not even the government, just to get what we want. We can't compromise what the Bible says, not even in the face of possibly starving and watching our family starve with us. And that's hard to hear. That is tough to hear. But it doesn't make it any less true. And this is what some Christians at this church in Thyatira were dealing with. The truth of the matter is, Jesus doesn't promise that we won't suffer, nor that our family and our children won't suffer along with us, even to death. Again, hard words to hear. Right. But we know from Romans 8, 17, that believers are, as I'm quoting scripture here, children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided We suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Yeah. Like we said in the last episode, Jesus starts out in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, reminding the persecuted people that he is firstborn of the dead. He does that to remind them and to comfort them and us that there's more than just this life. Actually, there's something far better. But he starts the letter of this church specifically reminding these people that he is the son of God. He's reminding them that he's deity. He's God. He makes the rules. He gets to because he's creator. He never says anywhere that we won't suffer or that we won't physically die. That's a sobering thought when we think about ignoring or compromising his word for our own comfort. Absolutely. And we've talked about this. Jesus didn't sacrifice anything for his own comfort. He never thought about his own comfort. No. Nope. So, Chris, let's talk about the fact that some in the church in Thyatira have committed adultery with this Jezebel and that she has children. These are most likely spiritual offspring, practicing and probably teaching and advancing her false theology and false practices. False teaching in the church is to be stopped. Jesus calls it here the deep things of Satan. Yeah, and Jesus gave this false prophetess time to repent, but she doesn't. Being thrown on her sickbed, as the words say, and her children dying harkens back to the covenant curse for disobedience in Deuteronomy 28. The Old Testament Jezebel that you mentioned suffered the consequences of that curse. Her and her offspring died, and she was eaten by dogs. You know, the corpse of the wicked are often eaten by dogs and birds or beasts of the field. In fact, we're going to see them feasting on dead carcasses of the wicked later in Revelation 19. Not a fun way to die. No. There was a remnant in the church of Thyatira, though, that didn't hold to the false teaching. Jesus says that he's not going to lay on them any other burden other than what they've already been putting up with in the church and with these people. Chris, it's a burden to be a true believer in a church where there's false teaching going on and nothing's being done about it. It's got to be horrendous in a time of harsh persecution to see others who claim to be believers living the life by compromising God's word. Yeah, that's got to be tough. That's got to be horrible. And it's got to be comforting to them that someday they and we will reign with Christ. And we're not exactly sure what that's going to look like, but we can take comfort in it. When this passage mentions pottery being dashed to pieces, that's hearkening back to Psalm 2, where it says that Jesus will break the wicked with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2 ends with a warning to be wise, serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. A good warning to heed. Absolutely. Okay, so we still have three churches to look at. The next church is in Sardis. I'll read that. 
Revelation 3, 1 to 6 says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, Rose, Jesus' opening here starts out with him saying that he has the Holy Spirit. So there's an allusion to what some or most of the people in this Sardis church are missing, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because they're not believers. And we don't know when Jesus is going to return. There's a call to wake up here. Twice in its history, in 547 or 546 B.C., and again in 214 B.C., Sardis had been sacked, first by Cyrus II and then by Antiochus III. It happened because their watchmen hadn't detected the enemy. They felt that their city was safe or impregnable because it sat up on a hill, so they got lazy. Both times, the enemy snuck into Sardis. Chris, this is why we wrote our book, No Half Truths Allowed, Understanding the Complete Gospel Message. There's a lot of people who feel quote-unquote safe, but may not be safe at all. They may not even be saved, but they think they are. They thought they've been doing the quote-unquote Christian thing and have been getting Christian teaching, but they've been taught and led by imposters, wolves in sheep clothing in the church who snuck into the sheep pen. Jesus talks a lot about this in John chapter 10. He does. This church in Sardis looked good on the outside, at least partially because of their works, according to verse 2. They had a good reputation. They quote-unquote fit in, with the large Jewish community that was around them, and Judaism was a religion that was okayed by the Roman Empire. The Sardis church didn't make waves. They didn't proclaim Jesus as Lord, or at least not too loudly, nor could they balk at the fact that Caesar was to be proclaimed Lord, according to Roman law. Most of this church was spiritually dead, not saved. Their works were found, as Jesus says, not complete in the sight of my God. In John 6, 29, Jesus tells us what the work of the Father is. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Now, there are a few true believers in this church, a remnant. So hope for revival isn't totally lost. The church has heard the true gospel message, and they need to hold on to that, and they need to repent. Good works doesn't save anybody. It doesn't matter what the community thinks of you as a church, if Jesus isn't your Lord and Savior. No, it does not. The church is supposed to worship God and proclaim the true and complete gospel message. If that's not the focus of your church, it needs to change. If your church does a lot of work and acts of service but's devoid of the gospel, this is a warning to you. What is your church teaching? If it's that God wants you to be happy, healthy, and prosperous, or he wants to fulfill your heart's desires and plans, or your pastor is teaching just about anything else that whips you up on a Sunday into an amening frenzy, <laughs> then you might need to change your church. Absolutely. A lot of churches talk about salvation and what Jesus did, but they're not really explaining it. Do you know why you need saving? Do you know what you need saving from? Do you know why you were created in the first place? Why did God create humanity at all? Do you know what your overarching purpose in life is? Do you know what Jesus suffered for you besides the excruciating death of dying on a cross and the things that he suffered right before that? Do you know that he died in your place and took the punishment you deserve? Do you understand all that? And do you understand what the resurrection even means? Well, if you can't answer those questions, you need to be somewhere where they're teaching you those things and more. Rose, I want to say one more thing here. If your church is preaching about social justice instead of the gospel, you should look for a different church. A woke church 
may sound biblical because it sounds friendly and accepting. And social justice issues are very important. But heart change, the only thing that leads to true and lasting change of behavior, only comes from the true gospel message. That's right. That is the only life-transforming message. And Chris, that's an important point you make, because especially in the last few years, lots of churches, even ones that used to be solid theologically and doctrinally, and I'm going to throw Redeemer Presbyterian out there in New York, they've started moving in this direction of it's all about social justice, and they're not leaning on these solid theological doctrines and beliefs. They're abandoning God's gospel for a man-centered gospel, which is not the gospel at all. Nope. It's splitting the church even farther than ever. And it could be, in fact, it probably will have huge effects that most people aren't even thinking about. I agree. It's something that needs to be stopped. So Sardis was a dead church. There's lots of them out there. A dead church isn't dead because it's one that's barely hanging on financially or because it only has a dozen members. A church isn't dead because they don't sing contemporary music (laughs) or that they don't seem very lively. A dead church isn't dead because they have all older people or because they have all Caucasians or because they don't have many children in the congregation. A dead church is a church that doesn't proclaim the true and complete gospel message. If you can't articulate what you believe and why you believe it, you need help. And your church needs help. If your church is preaching anything other than you're a sinner who needs God's grace and then an explanation of what God's done for you for his glory, your church needs help. Agreed. Okay, so let's move on to the church in Philadelphia. Revelation 3, 7 to 13 says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews but aren't, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet And they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, Chris, the church in Philadelphia only gets a commendation from Jesus. They stood firm, they kept his word, they didn't deny him, And in the not-too-distant future of receiving this letter, during the time of Polycarp, who we mentioned, there was going to be some real harsh persecution, and a lot of people were going to suffer martyrdom. Yeah. Jesus begins this letter stating that he is the one who holds the key to the door of life. No one else can open it or shut it. He tells this church the door is open for them. For people who have little power and are suffering and are going to really continue to suffer, even to death, has to be a comfort. Yeah. And once again, Jesus mentions that Jews who think they're a part of God's family yet are persecuting Christians. And he calls these the synagogue of Satan. Uh, Jesus is going to make them bow at the feet of those believers. How's that for encouragement? It sounds pretty good to me. That's what I would want to happen. But Jesus also promises to keep the Philadelphia church from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. So we need to address this a little bit. The left behind believers think this means believers are going to be raptured off the face of the earth before a period of great tribulation. But believers are promised temptation, trial, and tribulation over and over again through the Bible. We've already said it, I think, in this episode. So that idea doesn't seem to fit here. Also, this passage has to have some meaning for the actual people that it was written to, So a future rapture out of harm's way isn't what this is about at all. 
Yeah, I agree. This is talking about spiritual protection. Because believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit for salvation, they can never lose it. So Jesus is telling this church that they can endure whatever suffering is coming, even suffering an intense time of tribulation brought on the world by God. Jesus prayed to the Father for believers. In John 17, 15, Jesus said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And yet he still tells these believers, hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Paul says the same thing in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So it seems like they're saying the opposite of they're going to be kept. So why do they say this? Well, because unlike the Nicolaitans who practice antinomianism, which we talked about, I think, in the previous episode was a Christian who thinks because they have grace, they can do whatever they want, sin however much they want, and just because they already have grace. But we can't be lax about our faith. We can't go on sinning as if it means nothing and trample on the grace of God. Absolutely. That's called cheap grace. And it's unbiblical. And if that's what we're doing, then we need to ask ourselves, are we really Christian? Exactly. So how did they and how do we know that believers can make it through all these rough trials and even this harsh tribulation and persecution? Well, we get the answer from Jesus in verse 10. I will keep you. And we get it from Paul through the Holy Spirit in verse 13 of the Philippians chapter 2 passage. Paul says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's God that keeps us. Absolutely. God keeps us. He seals us. He protects us. It's referred to as perseverance of the saints. And we persevere because God is the one doing the preserving. If we were left on our own, we could never do it. Nope. Okay, Chris, one more church to look at, and that's the church in Laodicea. And Revelation says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have grown wealthy and need nothing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, white garments so that you may be clothed and your shameful nakedness not exposed, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so this city was known for its medical and its textile industries. The city was rich. You know, you want to know how rich this city was, Rose? This city was so rich that when an earthquake destroyed it in AD 60, they declined imperial disaster relief. Can you imagine? Wow, that's rich. (laughs) Can you imagine a city declining government help after a natural disaster? Certainly not now when they're all begging for it. Heck no. A lot of people get this passage totally wrong because they think Jesus is saying, either be for me, meaning all in or hot, or be against me, cold, or be my enemy, because I'd rather have you be one or the other and not lukewarm. But that's not what Jesus is saying in this passage at all. No. And you have to understand the history and geography to kind of get this right. Laodicea was rich, but it had no water. There were two sources to get water. There was the Hierapolis, which had mineral-rich hot springs, or Colossae, which had cold water. So their water came into the city through two aqueducts that were about five or six miles long. And by the time both got there, they were... Lukewarm. That's right. (laughs) And lukewarm water isn't refreshing to drink, and lukewarm mineral water isn't good for its healing properties. I mean, no one takes a lukewarm Epsom salt bath. So their problem is their distance from the source. 
Exactly. The church thinks they don't need anything. And for Christians, this is deadly Ugh. because that's when we stop praying. In contrast to that, when we're desperate, that's when we find ourselves on our knees praying to God. This church was prideful in their own moral goodness. They'd forgotten the true message of the gospel, that our works can't save us, and so that we're so dead in our sins, we couldn't possibly even reach out for God without him first regenerating our lifeless hearts of stone. We could never possibly be morally good enough to be pleasing to our perfectly holy God because he requires sinless perfection. That's why we need Jesus as our Savior. That's right. We need his perfect record of righteousness imputed to us, meaning given to us. He took our punishment, the punishment of God's wrath, in our place, then clothed us in his perfect robe of righteousness. The Laodicean church had forgotten this, and they started patting themselves on the back in a way about their own goodness and the good stuff they were doing and their self-sufficiency. And sadly, there's a lot of churches out there today like that. And Chris, a Christian can move far away from God, even sinning grievously, and God will discipline his children. He'll refine them like gold. He'll bring them back. And he's telling the Laodicean church to hurry up and repent of their self-reliance and start relying on him. Yep. And Jesus isn't standing at the door knocking and wringing his hands and hoping someone will open it. This is used out of context evangelistically, just like it is in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is also talking to believers. He's talking to his church here. Ones he loves is how he refers to them, according to verse 19. Jesus doesn't come to the door as a salesman, hoping that his sales pitch works. <laughs> he comes to the door as the master of the house who expects his servants to open it. He expects his servants, those who, are, those who are his people, to open it quickly. They're supposed to be zealous and repent from verse 19 so that they can have close personal fellowship with him again. And our prayer is that we all do that often. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in to this special bonus episode. As always, we will go back to our regular schedule and on Monday we will release the next part of Revelation. As always, we welcome comments, questions, and feedback. If you like what you heard, please rate and review us on whatever platform you're listening on. Have a blessed day, everyone. Bye.